Hello and welcome to the program. Well, as they say, behind every successful man, there's a woman. But have you ever wondered what makes a woman successful in a career? Well, it's constant hard work, rock solid determination and support of the family. I have one such woman with me today who with a grit and determination has achieved dizzy heights in a career and that too in a field like particle physics. Well, uh, she's a professor at the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore, which is a premier research organization of our country. She has also been bestowed with the prestigious Padma Shri. She has written a number of books and she's also edited books on uh, Indian women scientists and also international women scientists. Well, we are talking about Professor Rohini Godbole. Professor Godbole, a warm welcome to the program. Hello. At the very outset, uh, let's talk about your journey as a scientist. Tell us, right from your childhood, how this journey started. Okay, that's a very big question. I will try to give the answer as short as possible though. See, I was born in a very middle class family, but the point was that the family really cared about education and knowledge. Education was always a very, very important part of our lives in the family, in the city, and I was always pretty good in my school. Mm -hmm. I more or less was always at the top of my class. Uh -huh. But I must say that uh, till I was in the eighth grade, we were not even taught any science okay. as a subject. So till then I didn't even know that, you know, because we were a girl's school, mm -hmm. we were taught home science. Okay. So then, but in the eighth, the, what happened were two important things. One thing was that in the seventh grade, there used to be a state level examination and science was a question paper. Okay. So my school teachers, women school teachers, took extra time to teach me science. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my learning science. Okay. And then I got uh, in SSC, actually, I think that was the SSC 11th year, right? 11 plus 4. So I got the uh, first place and a special award for general science and stuff like that. Okay. And then I appeared for what used to be called the science talent, national science talent search examination. Mm -hmm. This was, mind you, 1969. So we are talking of many, many <laughs> decades yes. back. And that actually, the requirement was that to get the scholarship, you had to commit yourself to pure science. Okay. And somehow that was always my, that was, that went without thinking. And slowly I realized that physics is what I love because physics asks about questions about the basis of our universe. How do things work? And that's what really, so I want to use mathematics mm -hmm. and that's why I started doing theoretical physics. So by this time I knew I want to do research. And after that I went to the United States of America where I did my PhD. Okay. Then I came back to India. I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Then I was also a faculty in, in University of Bombay after which I moved to India Institute of Science, Bangalore. And in between, I have been a uh, visiting professor, a visiting research scientist, many places in the world, like Geneva, Hamburg, okay. and many, many places, in fact. And I think I have had a fun ride doing science. Wonderful. And I have enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, Professor Godbole, after all the challenges, after all the hard work, you know, uh, you, you have won the prestigious Padma Shri Award from the Government of India. How does it feel from inside? Okay, I should say that it feels good, of course. And it feels good on three different levels. Mm -hmm. First level is, of course, that yes, I'm happy. That in some sense, I think uh, it feels great to have people, common people, People, or your, your, all your own government who need not know about the science you do to say great we are we are very proud of yeah. you. So that's an acknowledgement. That is an, a person, so I would say it's a bit like a lifetime achievement award but not from your scientific peers uh, but from, from the government, from the, the government, from the country and that one feels very proud about it at the personal level. At another level I feel very happy because the subject in which I work it's a very esoteric subject. Hmm. So to the governments, to the common society, it's not even clear why should we be doing research in this subject. 
and i think to me it's a great great re reflection on the importance that our government our society uh, plays at the foot of pure science so for me it's a recognition that pure science is something to be pursued and last but not the least i'm also rather proud that and happy because i am about one of the 17 or 18 women who have be got their padma shri for science and engineering wonderful wonderful okay? so these are the three three different levels i'm really quite proud and happy professor godbole will continue our conversation it's time now for a quick break okay India Science Channel was launched in the year 2019 by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. The internet-based dedicated science web channel is being implemented and managed by Vigyan Prasar, committed towards science communication. The channel features science documentaries, discussions on current topics, interviews and different programs covering the entire landscape of science and technology to make science popular among the masses. India Science is a flagship project of Vigyan Prasar. And over an year and a half, we have produced more than 1,200 videos of different sizes, lengths, and are from different genres and for different domains for the people of the country. We've, uh, we've taken, we've spoken, we've gotten, uh, we've dived deep into the reams of uh, different domains of science and technology. And we have uh, gotten news, stories, films, videos, in almost every format that you can think of. OTT, for that matter, is a great platform that helps uh, anybody to look for any news, any item, any uh, video, any documentary at any point in time. All you need to do is to subscribe a channel for it. One can also download India Science mobile app from Google Play Store or Apple Store to view this channel. Welcome back, viewers. We are in conversation with Professor Rohini Godbole. Uh, Professor Godbole, mm -hmm. you are into particle uh, physics, uh, something which is, you know, which could be like Greek and Roman for the for the common man. Yeah. Tell us what this field is all about and what is your focus area. Okay, that's actually rather. Even though you think that the public doesn't know about it, it can be explained in one very simple line. And I actually, what I do is even more simpler. So what I do is what is called theoretical particle physics. So what is theoretical particle physics? It's the, you know, all of us know about Newton's law of motion. It tells me how a particle moves under action of a force. Now particle physics is about finding what are the fundamental constituents of matter and how do these particles interact with each other or how do these particles move under the action of different, different forces. Okay. And the wonderful thing about theoretical particle physics is that in the last hundred years, yeah. theoretical particle physics had been able to, has been able to understand what are the fundamental constituents of matter and what are the, that every force that we see is actually arises out of four one of the four fundamental forces. So that is the beauty that not only that this table is made up of only protons, neutrons and electrons or this chair, but the way the fundamental particles interact with each other can effectively be understood only in terms of four basic forces and that is the subject of particle physics. And just like you have Newton's equations of motion, you ask yourself a question, how can I write equations of motion of fundamental particles under the action of these fundamental forces? Okay. And that is the subject of fundamental particle physics and a, theory, a role of a theorist in it. I think that's easy enough to understand. Exactly, yeah. Except that the mathematics required is very different. The basic mathematics that is required is that of general theory of relativity, special theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, so all these words which are Greek and Latin, but those we don't need to understand to understand what the concept of particle physics is all about. 
That's true. And in addition to this, there are these many of these theories get tested in very elaborate experiments mm-hmm. at very high energy particle colliders with gigantic detectors. And some names even common public would have heard. One is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which about seven years ago today, mm. now about seven years ago, found the Higgs boson, which completed our general picture of the world of fundamental particles and forces among them and its mathematical description. Yeah. So I hope this answers what particle physics is. Exactly. Yeah. I am a theoretical particle physicist. And now that I have developed all the theories that I'm telling you about, which got tested at the Higgs, uh, by the discovery of the Higgs boson, but I have worked on a part of that theory. Okay. In all my life as a particle physicist, I have been working as to how can I look for the Higgs boson in these big experiments and how can I advise my experimental colleagues how best to look for it, how best to study its properties and how best to conduct experiments to know whether this is all that there is or is there something more? Are there some more questions, some more extensions of this theory and how do I find if they are there, how do I find experimental proof for those theories? So that's my own particular angle to it. Yeah. Professor Godbole, it's often uh, you know uh, difficult for people to understand you know uh, uh, this kind of blue sky uh, research and they often feel ki, what is the application in day to day life. Could you explain that? Yeah, that's a good question and I think you are not you know you are not the first one to ask this question. I mean I can begin with an anecdote. The anecdote is about uh, Michael Faraday who invented the laws of electricity and magnetism which has made, made today possible even the wireless uh, recording of this particular interview. <laughs> but you know, when he was asked and presented it to the British uh, chan- Chancellor as they call it, which is our counterpart, counterpart of our Finance Minister. So he said, Sir, I don't have any application in mind today, but I dare say someday you will tax it. <laughs> so I think it's a bit like that. Wonderful. It's Wonderful. a bit like that, okay. And one of the most biggest example I can give you for my subject, which is particle physics, Mm. is that internet or web, World Wide Web, which has changed the way we do finance, the way we do our social interactions, the way we live. And all this, mind you, was invented by particle physicists to exchange data because particle physics experiments are huge. Mm -hmm. The experiments are huge, the experimental groups are huge. And even the theorists like me, theorists, particle experimentalists and accelerator builders all have to actually work together, all have to exchange information. So this World Wide Web was constructed so that people can exchange their information because particle physics is not done in one lab, in one institute, in one country even. It's happening across the world. There are international labs, there are international labs where people collaborate. So World Wide Web was essentially developed. Grid computing developed by particle physicists. Okay. Now, it's being used to answer very big questions about weather modeling and what have you. Okay. Okay. And last but not the least, I want to give you a really op- abstruse example. Right. Fundamentals of quantum mechanics. What is the meaning of quantum mechanics? This was a very fundamental question which had even perturbed people like Einstein. Mm. Okay. There is a Einstein, uh, Podolsky and Rosen, a very big paradox. Okay. And now, some of the people who kept on working on fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, now suddenly it appears that that research is going to be uh, help us to solve problems of uh, cryptology or quantum computation. So what I'm trying to tell you is that society and the governments also have to realize that you have to actually support pursuit of fundamental science and the fundamental and the questions, applications, come applications come. Come, come. Most of the time the applications come, sometimes they come a little longer. Okay. For example, superconductivity, yeah. lasers, these were not invented so that I can find an application. These were just invented to see how light works. Okay? And later on, you know, later on, suddenly you found come that you and can there's up, they have changed and they change everything. That's true. Okay. That's true. Professor, also tell us about the, you know, interesting projects which are going on around the world um, as far as this field of particle okay, physics. Okay, that's is a concern. good question because again, as I told you, in particle physics, most of the projects, at least the big experimental projects, have to be international. They have to be planned for decades, and they have to be planned by big groups. 
So there is one that is happening. You, you, all of us know about Large Hadron Collider. Right. So this Large Hadron Collider will now run, have the life for about 20 years with increasing the number of particles that collide with each other. Technically that is called high luminosity. Maybe particles will be accelerated to yet higher energies within the limitations of technology again. So all that will keep on happening. So that is one set of experiments for particle physics that will happen. Then there is a new type of collider, which is high energy electron positron machine. Okay. That is on the horizon. China is thinking about building one. Mm -hmm. And Japan is also thinking about hosting one. Discussions are on. But even more importantly, there are also experiments involving, big experiments involving neutrinos. These are called neutrino laboratories. Mm -hmm. And in fact, India also has plans to have uh, uh, build what is called International Neutrino Observatory. Professor Godbole, it's time for a quick break. But okay. when we come back from the break, mm -hmm. we'll talk about women scientists and especially women scientists in India. Well, time for a quick break. Stay tuned. India Science Channel was launched in the year 2019 by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. The internet-based dedicated science web channel is being implemented and managed by Vigyan Prasar, committed towards science communication. The channel features science documentaries, discussions on current topics, interviews and different programs covering the entire landscape of science and technology to make science popular among the masses. India Science is a flagship project of Vigyan Prasar. And over an year and a half, we have produced more than 1,200 videos of different sizes, lengths, and are from different genres and for different domains for the people of the country. We've, uh, we've taken, we've spoken, we've gotten, uh, we've dived deep into the reams of uh, different domains of science and technology. And we have uh, gotten news, stories, films, videos, in almost every format that you can think of. OTT, for that matter, is a great platform that helps uh, anybody to look for any news, any item, any uh, video, any documentary at any point in time. All you need to do is to subscribe a channel for it. One can also download India Science mobile app from Google Play Store or Apple Store to view this channel. Welcome back after the break and uh, before we continue our conversation with Professor Rohini Godbole, let's take a look at women scientists in India. Keeping in mind the social fabric of India, a number of schemes, scholarships, missions and initiatives were launched by the Government of India after independence to increase the literacy rate and share of women's participation in workforce of India. However, this dark gender ratio in the high position became apparent when photographed of the President of India with the Vice Chancellors of Central Indian Universities appeared year after year showing only few women in leadership position. Even in the premium institutes such as IIT, Triple IIT, IIMs, there is no single women director at the helm currently. Even the gender ratio of the most prestigious Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Award for Science and Technology is worrisome as there are only 17 women awardees as compared to 523 male scientists which indicates that less number of women are able to achieve heights in their scientific career. As per the statistics, although the number of women obtaining PhD in sciences is around 37%, only 15% of these women have continued their career and are currently in faculty positions in various universities and institutes. These figures mean that although a large fraction of women are training in science, but they are not able to continue their career in science, which means that science's pipeline is leaky. To understand the reasons for the loss of trained female scientists from scientific manpower in India, and to identify strategies and provisions to promote entry and to retain them in science, 
a study was conducted with support from Niti Aayog. The study recommended that work environment and regulatory features are crucial for continuity of women in science. Flexibility in service continuity norms, option of work from home and flexi hours can help in this regard. The study pointed out that infrastructure such as housing, childcare facilities, healthcare services etc can also help in retaining more women by plugging the leaky pipeline. To retain women in sciences, a number of schemes and awards have been rolled out by the Ministry of Science and Technology such as Vigyan Jyoti, Curie program, Kiran schemes, Biocare etc which can give wings to the dreams of women researchers of India. Well, now let's continue our discussion with Professor Rohini Godbole. Professor Godbole, to talk about women scientists, especially in India, we see, you know, when we talk about enrollments, the enrollments is quite high and girls and women usually come forward for research or doing a PhD. But later on, it somehow fizzles out and they don't end up uh, in leadership positions. Why is that? It is indeed true that in general participation of women in original discovering science, doing scientific discoveries research, yeah. and research is not very high. And that's the story world over okay. and historically. So we are not talking of today, last 20 years. From the beginning of science, this has been almost the story. But in India right now, the encouraging thing is, as you correctly said, a large number of women do their PhD in science and quite a big fraction. In fact, in PhD fraction is about 25 to 30 percent for the last 30 years. Okay. So we are not short of trained scientific women power, but then we still don't have them coming out. Right now, one of the I think the general reasons are really OK. The reason that is given most of the time and which is perhaps right is the family. OK, so that's an obvious one that women give up or choose to give up or have to give up because of the family, because of the problem of dual careers. So these are sort of obvious reasons. And these obvious reasons, I think, can be handled by firstly making changes in the system, by making policies. Okay. So that is a somewhat simpler question to handle, though I think a big awareness and social awareness is required so that such policies are undertaken. Okay. So that's an obvious one. But I think there is also another one, which is not obvious, subtle, but that is called an invisible bias. Mm -hmm. And the reason was in the survey that I made, I can, I'm going to quote what I'm telling you based on both this. Yeah. So in the survey, I actually asked these women who have actually dropped out. Okay. They were very difficult to locate. Mm -hmm. Why did you give up? And many of them said, yes, of course, family responsibilities, so we chose to give up. Mm -hmm. But many of them equally said another big factor was non-supportive okay. or inflexible attitudes on part of the of, peers, uh, of the, not just peers, okay. of the society, of institutions and then peers too. Okay. And the scientists themselves or the lack of mentoring. Professor, but do you think, you know, the government can formulate policies where, you know, especially we see that for a woman, you know, after a certain age, you know, marriage becomes important. She has to take care of kids and all. Can she make a comeback? So can we have flexible policies where okay. if she wants to take a break for five, six years or even 10 years and then come back again and okay. start working? Now, this is where actually I have a very strong statement to okay. make. You know, firstly, I told you in the beginning itself that for a scientist, after doing a PhD, you need to do the apprenticeship. Yeah. And it is at the same period that your body clock is also ticking. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have to start a family. Yeah. So for a science career, mm -hmm. It's okay, I mean, since there is nothing else existed, yeah. we can have policies to come back. Mm -hmm. But, and they exist right now. Mm -hmm. But to my mind, science also does not wait. Okay. So if you take a break of five years, the instruments you are using are different. The questions you are asking are different. So you mean to say it would be difficult, almost it, impossible it, to it, come back? You might come back, but you will never reach the heights. Okay. So the whole point is how to make the, how to juggle things. How to get over this between the home breakers. and the lab? And, and the point is that one of the most important things one has to realize yeah. that it's not just one person's problem. Mm -hmm. It's not the poor woman's problem. It's the problem of the family. You know, child bearing can be done only by a woman, but child rearing can be done by both parents. That's true. Right. Even more important, 
what happens is that because again I've come back to the issue you mentioned, because we lose women who have already trained, it's like an economic loss. That's right. Pragmatically, we have spent money in training this and a country which is sort of committed to a path of innovation, how can we afford to miss this? How can you afford to lose this? So you want to keep this, bring these women back in the career or keep them in the career and a science career, both for themselves, for sense of justice, yeah. then for the country and then for science itself, because science only can gain from diversity. Tell us about Leelawati's daughters. Okay, Leelawati's daughters was some, actually, I'm quite proud of it. I will tell you this because this is now much after we brought out the book. Now, in, for example, Royal Society, five years after we brought out the book, mm -hmm. brought out a volume called She Speaks. Okay. So what is special about Lilavati's Daughters is that women who achieved a lot in, in pre-independent India, in, independent India, who worked in science in India. And our idea was the following, that if you ask for somebody, name me five famous Indian scientists, even though there have been famous women scientists, you won't get their names. If you ask them, Name five women scientists the world over, you will start with Madame Marie Curie. You know, they were great. You take inspirations from them. But the point is that there have been heroines close to the home. Mm. And we wanted to bring stories of those heroines. So that was one thing. But there was yet another one which I already mentioned. We wanted to find out what helped these women and what hindered these women. And what I found that is very impressive that most of them said, that's where I told you the answer, that behind every successful woman, there is a family. Supportive, so supportive family. Supportive family or supportive society. Because most of them said they got help from parents or parents-in-law, extended family. And that are, and, and very importantly, good mentorship. I want uh, uh, from you, you know, what would you tell uh, young girls and young women who aspire to be uh, scientists in future? Oh, I, I think the answer is very, very simple. The answer is believe in yourself. Okay? And if you believe in yourself, sky is the limit to what you can achieve. Gender does not, need not held you back, hold you back. Wonderful. Professor Godbole, on that wonderful thought, uh, let's wind up this conversation. It's mm -hmm. been a pleasure and a great privilege to have you on the program. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You.